Yes, my name is Sammy Castonguay. I'm a geologist by trade. Um, so I tend to look at things with a very um, kind of rock and hammer point of view. Um, I'm also the program director here at Friends of the Hawaii. I've met many of you, been on hikes with many of you, read your name dozens of times, Patricia, but I've never actually gotten to meet you. So good to put a face with a name. And, um, and as mentioned, uh, teach at the community college, astronomy, um, uh, meteorology, energy, and of course my um, specialty geology. Now, uh, tonight, um, I have really three main topics that I'd like to um, lead us through here. So this is called an introduction to stargazing. So if you already kind of secretly to yourself are like, well, I'm introductory, but I stargaze all the time, then, you know, some parts of this might be a little bit slow for you. Um, this is really geared towards uh, you know, someone who's really getting their start at the night sky, um, but hopefully there's material that can, um, that can help all of us, right? Even the advanced stargazer. Um, I also like uh, and hope that on the YouTube videos that some teachers uh, show their, their grade school kids some of these videos um, so it can be really accessible for, for younger students as well. Okay, so some of the first things I'll go through quickly because this is archived on our YouTube page is a little bit about gear for stargazing uh, for a good experience, setting your awareness in place, and then setting some really um, intentional processes to go through so you can have a good, um, a good experience and gain knowledge while stargazing, gain that practical experiential knowledge. Okay, then um, I'll spend about 15 minutes um, talking about the importance of natural night skies. And I almost, I, I want to say it, I'll say the word rant. Okay, it might seem at maybe ranty, but really this is to underscore the importance of what we're, the immensity of what we're talking about out here and how lucky we are um, in where I'm joining you from, from Ontario, Oregon, uh, to be on the edge of a, of a vast sanctuary of dark skies. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the threats of, of light pollution. And then um, what we're going to really uh, focus on tonight, as far as the stars and names that you'll come away with, what you can identify is the winter circle. And I'll go through um, more of those details at the time. Now, before we go um, much further, I do want to acknowledge um, as friends of the Hawaii, we are conservation advocates and stewards and um, outdoor recreation, responsible recreation enthusiasts of the whole Hawaii region, which includes the watershed as well as the Hawaii front. And this was all land, ancestral territories of the northern Paiute and some of the western Shoshone um, tribes, all people that were forcibly removed from their homes. Um, by the United States government and, and settlers. And though that um, past is, is atrocious and unfortunate, um, it's the least we can do while being here on these lands and being steward of these lands and respecting these lands to acknowledge um, the past, okay? Um, let's see. So the font here is a little bit small because all three of these slides are in archive at our YouTube page. And I went through each of these really slowly um, during the first few stargazing experiences last year. So first thing um, I highly recommend just being, you know, prepared for the weather, right? Just like any activity that you're going to spend time outside, do yourself a favor and dress way more <laughs> than you think you're going to need because you can always take layers off if you happen to get warm. Uh, now hiking outside like we did today during the Hawaii Hiking Club, we hiked about six miles, you know, you're hiking in the cold, so you're generating body heat. But in stargazing, you're pretty much just doing this, right? You're sitting and looking in the sky. So it's that much more important that you have warm clothes and layers and I recommend some kind of warm drink as well. Um, hot cocoa, whatever you pour in that hot cocoa is up to you, but some kind of warm liquid to help warm you from the inside out. Um, this can also be important as kind of a time gauge. You know, how long have I actually been out here? Oh, I'm halfway through my hot chocolate. 
oh, my mug is cold and my cho hot chocolate's gone. I've been out here for a long time. Um, so that's part of the process is gauging the amount of time that you've been out looking at the stars. Okay. So I'd recommend dressing warm. Uh, then if you're going to take notes at all, um, using a headlamp that has uh, the red light, or you can buy some red cellophane to put over the light. But that's really important. So you're not using bright white light that blinds or you know overwhelms your rods and cones and you can't see the stars. So warm gear, a red light. And then the other two things here, the planet locator and or the app, the, the phone app, uh, so here's your space phone in your pocket, um, Stellarium. It's about $15 uh, I just found on the i platform. Um, and I think it's about four on the Android platform, or at least was like 99 years ago when I had it then. Um, but I do highly recommend the third thing for an enjoyable, informative, fun experience is for you to have a reference. Okay, the, this um, webinar might serve as some type of reference, but it's not going to be the same as being able to navigate through an app or a star wheel um, to look at all of the stars and then to do that every night. So highly recommend, it's called the Edmonds Scientific Star Wheel if you want one of these analog things. And then of course, um, there's several apps available, but I, I really do recommend um, Stellarium, not like they pay me or anything like that, right? That's not the deal here. Um, it's an open source software and it is available on Linux and works on a lot of platforms. Um, so that's the one I recommend. Okay, um, so another part of, of having a fun, informative, enjoyable experience is setting up this kind of, this is how I stargaze process. If you kind of treat it willy nilly and just randomly look at the stars whenever it occurs to you, then that's kind of how you'll learn is just kind of willy nilly and whatever sticks to the walls or whatever, right? Um, but if you go about learning, like reading a book, left to right, top to bottom, this page, that page, just setting up some type of process and awareness is gonna really help. So awareness, what does that mean? Knowing where you are in space. I don't mean in the solar system, okay? I just mean in north, east, west, in your directional space, okay? Uh, so using a compass or again, using your space phone to be able to find north. That's crucial to know uh, when you're going out stargazing where you can expect north to be. Sure, we're gonna learn the North Star in one of these classes later and how to find the North Star. But let me tell you, it just really helps to have, to start building that intuitive sense of where North is at. And if you don't have that, then go ahead and rely on the phone or the compass. It'll take a lot of that questioning out of stargazing if you go ahead and start out knowing the directions, okay? Then some other simple things like what season are you in? When should you expect the sun to rise or the sun to set? How bright is the moon going to be? Okay, if we got to stargaze tonight, the moon's like 97% or 98% uh, full. So it'd be pretty bright in the night sky. And then um, another one uh, that is really handy to use while we're describing the night sky is, uh, and you can all do this at home. I can't actually see you in your screen, so don't worry. Um, but if you hold your hand at arm's length away, so that means stretching out your arm. Oh, that stretch feels good too. Stretching out your arm and then using your hand, if you make a fist, that's about 10 degrees. If you spread out your hand and do, the, do a shaka, that's 18 degrees. And the finger, there's a little more variability in this one. There's about one to one and a half degrees, okay? And the reason this works is your anatomy, even though you as a person are unique, the geometry of your length of your bone, say your forearm to your hand or your forearm to your upper arm, there's these ratios in the human body. You're probably thinking of the Leonardo da Vinci uh, drawing right now, right? You probably should be. But um, that ratio, because it's consistent through all of us, this works pretty well. All this is, is the arc distance in the 360 degrees of the night sky, okay? Uh, so the reason that's important is um, just imagine Orion's belt, okay? And maybe you don't know what that looks like quite yet. Maybe you're very familiar with Orion's belt. If I say go 
one fist away from the horizon above Orion's belt, you can put that fist right on top of Orion's belt and measure that. Okay, so this is a way that we can help quantitative, quantitatively look at the night sky. Okay, uh, then um, last part of that process is you got to go out with an objective. You know, where am I going to look? Am I going to look to the north, to the south, to the east? Focusing on just a couple of things is really going to help. Learning one thing at a time, that's going to help as it, as it always does. And then practice, 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 right? Um, okay, now spending a few more minutes on um, the importance of natural night skies, um, I wanted to make these four points about this, that dark skies are a cultural resource to humanity or all of Earth's creatures all over the globe. Okay, it's a cultural resource. Let's talk about light pollution, what that means, where it comes from, and then some solutions. Then um, doing some citizen science. So literally next week, using your space phone, you can be involved in the Globe at Night uh, project, gathering data on how dark the sky is where you live. Doesn't matter if you're in New York or Tampa Bay or San Diego, right? Measuring the night sky and the darkness and getting an understanding globally of the distribution of light pollution is really good. So please um, do that. Then I uh, wanted to mention a little bit about the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network and uh, pleading you to become an advocate for dark night sky. So what does that mean? That means talking about dark night skies at this point, right? Uh, really advocating for um, the night, the skies to remain dark and talking to people about light pollution and then showing people the stars. All right, so this is a cultural resource uh, globally for uh, humanity for several thousand years. Uh, so the bee man that's up there, it's oftentimes called, uh, that person is thought to be wearing a tapestry uh, made out of, or not made out of, but a tapestry that resembles the night stars. This is from Saharan uh, Africa, uh, about 14,000 years old. And then things like Stonehenge, uh, you know, stories like the winter solstice um, story about the, the day star and the sun, uh, the pyramids on, um, in Giza, uh, Teotihuacan outside of Mexico City. All of these, these sites and these cave paintings and these stories in mythology or the Greco-Roman stories come from cultures around the world that are all looking at the same night sky and developing different relationships about that same night sky. I think that's, it's beautiful, right? Phenomenally beautiful just to think of that, like all of our human stuff, but we are all under the same beautiful night sky, looking at the same constellations, North, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, right? Then I also wanna acknowledge where I'm from in, in South Dakota, um, the Lakota people also have a deep, orally translated for a long time, but also um, in writing star knowledge studies uh, that are that are passed down. And so uh, tonight, in tonight's topic, we're going to talk about what I usually refer to as the winter circle. Um, and then, um, but also here in the Lakota tradition, the same stars that we are talking about have been called the, the great hoop um, and are very important in um, the Lakota star knowledge traditions. Okay. So my first argument here is that dark night skies are a cultural resource. Be an advocate for the history, the present, and the future of humanity. All right, so light pollution. What is this stuff? Uh, well, um, the way that light works uh, as a wave and as a particle, um, it moves through space. And the atmosphere being made of particles as the um, as light is interacting with those particles, it either reflects or it refracts, so it changes angle. Um, so anywhere that you have a light source and atmosphere above that, the light will be distributed around depending on that atmosphere. Okay, uh, okay, so that was a lot of gobbledygook, but you know what light pollution means? It just means that there's a bright light over there, and I can't see this area of darkness because that light is bleeding into my space. Okay. Um, now this, um, 
the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder uh, recently published, I think this was 2000, um, I almost said 2009, 2019, the world, New World Atlas of Artificial Sky Brightness. Um, that they, they used, uh, they computed these light pollution with propagation software, okay, blah, blah, blah. But what that means is these were not on the ground measurements. When you look at this atlas, what you're seeing is satellite data combined with data of these are the distribution of lights. Here's how much they should glow, okay? It's a computer model. It's wonderful. It's great. It's good to know the extent of some of this stuff, but what we really need is on the ground data of dark night skies. Okay, so here's that atlas. Uh, you can see the, the warmer colors are really um, high light pollution. The unit is the candela here and uh, the micro candela. And uh, the darker areas then are in the cooler colors are those of low light pollution. Okay, so I just want to draw your attention. Uh, I'm going to put my cursor over this area, but look at this huge swath of dark, dark skies in all of uh, eastern Oregon, little part of Washington there, little part of northern Nevada, and a little part of southeastern Idaho. And this is, this is the Owyhee region. If you've been around with the friends of the Owyhee for long enough, we've shown you the maps. Maybe you're familiar with this. This is largely the Owyhee watershed down here in the tri-state area, and then a whole lot of other Eastern Oregon, okay? So this is the area that we at Friends of the Owyhee advocate for protecting the land beneath the sky, but we are also involved in keeping the sky and our cultural heritage of this beautiful night sky dark. Okay, um, so what are some of the solutions to uh, light pollution or keeping light pollution at bay? Let me back up. Uh, this bubble right here is Boise, the Boise bubble or the Boise Treasure Valley bubble. And so what we're talking about here, we can't, you know, Boise is growing and this bubble is going to slowly encroach, but it's only going to go so far. That we can't really do anything about. But what we can do, some other solutions, is within the area that we already identify as dark, 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 is to try to encourage proper lighting solutions. So using lighting that makes sense. And this is a, uh, an image showing she unshielded, capped, partially shielded, and fully shielded light. Uh, you can see the difference right there. We don't need to shoot the light up into space where nobody's going to use it right? We keep the light down here on the earth or maybe on the side of the buildings where we actually utilize the light. So first, lighting that makes sense. And then second, actually defining the edges of these areas that we're going to consider a dark sky preserve, reserve, sanctuary, park. There's a dozen different ways that this can play out, okay? Um, these do not have any legal standing. It's really important um, that these are not Gonna, you know, nobody's going to go to jail for using the wrong light bulb, right? Uh, what we're talking about here is incentivizing for the dark sky community, which includes you as a resident and the folks doing astrotourism, um, to keep lighting under control or under some sort of sense. Now, as I mentioned, to do this, we have to have that on the ground data to show how dark the night sky is, okay? Uh, here's a couple of examples, the Central Idaho Dark Sky Preserve, the Sun River Oregon designation a while ago. Those are links. So when we send you this PDF, you can use those links to go read those articles. Um, and maybe you're asking the question like, why? <laughs> why would you create a dark sky preserve or a dark sky sanctuary? Um, and that's a, that's a valid question, absolutely. Um, I could answer that with the, the first one, if you find interest in that, which is that this is a cultural resource, a multicultural resource that few places left around the world, especially that are close enough to population that people can drive to, can experience dark night skies like this. Okay. Um, the last thing I think we all want is to have to jump on two or three planes and go to a different nation with our passport to go see the Milky Way. Right now, we're not anywhere near that point that state, but that's the long game here. Um, so let's just all agree to preserve this shared multicultural resource. 
And then second, um, the state of Oregon is really interested in, in increased tourism, right? I mean, you know, if folks coming to visit the Oregon outback to see our dark night skies is interesting to small towns like, uh, like Riley or Lakeview um, over in uh, Harney or Lake County. Okay, so here's the area that we're talking about, that really dark area there, but um, that's the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network. Uh, we've officially joined that steering committee to have this conversation about how we propose to the International uh, Dark Sky Association of this being a designation. Uh, but we need that on the ground data. Exactly how dark is dark? Um, so we have these, I don't have my tool with me, I don't think. Oh yes, I do. Okay, um, I left the college in such a hurry. I thought maybe I left it, but we use uh, these things, these sky quality meters. Uh, Friends of the Hawaii, he has one. This one's Treasure Valley Community Colleges. Uh, we have two at the library here in Ontario. There's two in the library over in Harney County. Uh, we hope that coming soon, we can um, help the Vail Library, the McDermott Library, and maybe even the Ion Museum in Jordan Valley get a hold of these things. So you as citizens can go to those libraries, check these things out and go out for a night. And it's one button, use the button to gather how dark is dark, driving some of these paved roads, gravel roads that are out there and trying to define some of these boundaries. And if you're really interested in doing that, winter's a great time for it, as long as you're staying warm, please contact us, right? Contact Catalan, contact me directly, contact Tim. We do need help in collecting this dark night sky data. Okay, so there's your kits uh, that are at the, available at the library. Um, the kits come with a uh, star wheel constellation guide. They come with the SQM and a flashlight. Um, so again, these are available for checkout at the Ontario Library and Harney County Library currently, if you live within their um, areas. If you want to come borrow the one from Friends of the Hawaii, I'm sure we can do that. And then soon, hopefully, we get these in Vail, uh, the Ion Museum, and McDermott. Okay, so maybe you can't get an SQM from the library. Maybe you live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and you still want to gather this dark night sky data, not necessarily for our Oregon Outback project, but for the greater good, the greater global good of understanding the relationship between light pollution and dark night skies. Okay, so that's where your space phone comes in. Uh, you can download, as it says in the lower right hand corner, a dark sky meter for your space phone and the app called Loss of Night. Both of those things will work well and fine together. Uh, I'm not sure how well calibrated the instrument is here, but it is data that Loss of Night app will collect from you, okay? However, um, those apps are good, but the website globeatnight.org is better. This is the larger citizen data collection, and here are the dates that are here. So next week, January 24th to February 2nd during the new moon, well, actually, it's the very end of the waning moon through the new moon and the waxing moon, if there's clear night skies, use your phone in the globe at night to find the Orion constellation and then enter just a couple of things. I mean, they only take maybe four to five minutes uh, and move on your way to another site, right? Um, it would really, really help the process. So uh, on the website, there's a six step process that's there. Um, you can look at the slides that are here, but really going through the website or even just opening the website on your phone and going through that, it's really intuitive. Um, this month, we're looking at Orion, which is a part of the winter circle that we'll, um, I guess, starting about now, we'll uh, focus on. So check the app out tonight. Oh yeah, uh, so here's some of the video archive. Um, gosh, I forgot that I did this last night. Uh, I put in the video archive of all of the past um, topics and videos. So this live, the PDF, when you get this PDF, will go straight to those videos. And then for the Mar or for the 2022 um, stargazing, here's the topics to look forward to. Uh, we obviously we have the winter circle today. In March, we'll look at the five circumpolar constellations. In May, we'll look at the five visible planets. Um, in 
we'll talk about the five visible planets and how you can see them. In July, we'll talk about the 13 um, zodiacal constellations. Uh, then in September, the summer triangle. This is at the end of the summer, um, but um, you know, it's I, I wanted to cover those other topics uh, during that time. But finally, in the September, we'll be able to look at the summer triangle together. And then in November, uh, I want to talk about the day star, the sun, a little bit, and some of the cycling of the sun. Okay, so that's just for for future reference of the stargazing material um, that's here, and. Um, for tonight, when the clouds magically just go away, uh, it's really socked in here in Ontario, and it has been for like six days. We haven't gotten any sky viewing. I know because my students are all complaining to me. I keep giving them stargazing assignments, and they can't actually do it. But um, all right, so tonight, to set your awareness, look to the south. Okay, Generally, between the southeast and the southwest, corners or quadrants, this space in the south is going to be filled in by what we're going to call the winter circle. Okay, It's important to say that this circle is not a constellation. Okay, There are something like uh, 88 astronomically uh, named constellations that they use in you know, astronomy and physics. But this is what we call an asterism, okay? Just like the Big Dipper. You probably know the Big Dipper, but the Big Dipper is actually an asterism. It's just a small part of the constellation Ursa Major, okay? Now, the Winter Circle is actually made up of several constellations. It's so big. So it's not one constellation. It's actually a compilation of several. Okay, um, the best time to see the winter circle, winter, is uh, the midwinter season. About a month ago, you could stay up until about midnight and start to see the winter circle come up. And about two months from now, you will still be able to see the winter circle at night. Um, but again, you'll have to stay up a little bit, um, stay up a little bit later. Okay. Um, the sun sets where I'm at at 540, so it's already dark out there right now, clouds still. Um, and then the moon, as I mentioned, is 98% waning away. We had a full moon here a couple days ago, so it's really bright. Uh, 10 degrees, and you know it's important that you hold it at arm's length, not scrunched up here. 10 degrees, 18 degrees, 1.5 degrees. All right, so what we're going to do here, the process of going through this, we're going to find Orion's belt. Okay, well, that one you might already have trouble with, so that might have just ended right there. But uh, there's two constellations, one in the north and one in the south, that we're going to use a lot as a road marker, like a stop sign. It's just straight up. I know what a stop sign looks like. And we need to spend some time with Orion, Orion's belt, just to get an idea of what that looks like. Okay, uh, So we'll find Orion's belt, three stars in a row. And then about one to one and a half fists away from the horizon, so your fists being 10 degrees, is a very red star. And then similarly, one to one and a half fists towards the horizon, okay, towards the horizon or away from the horizon, is a blue star. And then we're going to continue in a counterclockwise motion, looking at all the brightest stars. And there's a little bit of vocabulary here that I want to make sure you're aware of. And that's uh, this word starts with a Z, the zenith. Z words are so great, right? So whenever you're looking for those in Scrabble or whatever, they're so valuable. But here's another one for you, the zenith. Uh, the zenith is 90 degrees from the horizon. So if you point out parallel with the Earth, that's the horizon. And then 90 degrees from that is straight overhead. So notice, as I scan the horizon, straight overhead is still straight overhead. Okay, um, that's what we call the zenith. All right. Um, well, once you get a nice clear view of the night sky, this is uh, taken from Stellarium, the, the computer program or phone program. Um, the sun, this is taken, I think, at about 715 
this is approximately what a nice dark night sky should look like. I mean, even from like Vail, Oregon, most of these are stars that you can see with the naked eye. Okay. Um, I did in the Stellarium program, you have all these wonderful options. I turned the atmosphere off. Okay, so all that means is that the atmosphere isn't reflecting the light of the sun. So what's shown here is a little bit darker than you would probably see at 715. Okay, um, just to, to be transparent about that. All right, so this is what the night sky looks like. And go ahead and find Orion's belt. Okay. I think a lot of you already know that one. You can point to it on your screen you know, just acknowledge it in your mind. Okay, go ahead and find Orion's belt. Okay. So after you've gotten a chance to, to find that, uh, that's right here. Hopefully you can see my cursor, but that's these three bright stars or well, moderately bright stars right in the middle of the screen. And they are just right in a row. You can't even fit a pinky between them when you put your hands up there. They are just right tight in a row. Uh, so they're very um, peculiar. <clears throat> There's very few other lines of stars in the night sky that fall in that, um, in that angle with the horizon. Okay, so notice the horizon below, it's relatively flat. I mean, it's got some curvature to it because of the program, right? And then the stars are about aligned with the horizon. I mean, they're tilted a little bit, okay? As Orion comes up, it's angled. As you see it in the south, it's about horizontal with the earth. And then it'll go down in the west, angled with the horizon. The only other three stars in the night sky that you might confuse this with is um, the Scorpion or Scorpius that also has three peculiar stars a little further away from each other and a little bit slightly different geometry but they are always up and upright instead of horizontal. Okay, so just a, just a little um, helping tip there, hopefully. All right, so we found Orion's belt right here. And then um, we can't measure off of the screen, unfortunately. Okay, but what you would do from the belt is using your fist, put it right on top of that center star and about one fist for really big fists or about a fist and a half for kid sized fists you come up away from the horizon to this red star. Okay, there's a red star. And then um, let's do the same one and a half fist down towards the horizon to a blue star. Okay, uh, and then let's continue in a clockwise motion with all of the brightest stars. Okay, so I, I'm on this one. And if I go in a clockwise motion, there's another really bright star clockwise motion, there's another really bright star, clockwise bright star that's kind of got two of equal brightness next to each other. And then for this one, if you go straight up from the horizon or up to the zenith, straight up overhead, you'll run into this last one or what you might call 12 o'clock. Okay. And then clockwise, yet again, down here to three o'clock, you get to this reddish star, okay? So that's the winter circle. It's, well, okay, it's an ellipse, right? It's not a perfect circle, it's an ellipse. Um, or maybe you think about it as the winter football because it's football season. Uh, but this oval winter circle is actually made up of the brightest stars in the night sky during the winter. You can see there the band of the Milky Way as it goes from the Southeast label down here all the way up to the Zenith. These, all of these bright stars are right along the band of the Milky Way, okay? Um, so that's why we were able to see all these very bright stars. All right, so I want you to go ahead and um, don't confuse my bullet points here as stars. I didn't notice that would blend in like that, but go ahead and go around several times. And just point at those stars, those bright ones, just like you're practicing out there in the night sky, right? Hey, you got the. All right. So just to make yourself, because there's other stars that are out there, right? I could easily draw a line to one of the other ones. 
but um, it's those ones that I really want you to, to, to hone in on. Now, next, let's, as we did with some of them, identify their color. They all have a slightly different hue to them. And then also let's call them out by name because they all have a name as well. Just like plants, you know, they all have a given name to them and it helps to really learn these things by calling out their name. All right, so that first one, there's Orion's belt and we go up one and a half fist and we see this reddish orange star and it's a bright star, okay? Um, and that star's name is Betelgeuse. Beetlejuice. Okay, don't say it. Don't say it again. Don't say it three times in a row, they say. Um, you all know what happens then. Okay, but there's the star named Beetlejuice. And you've probably heard about Beetlejuice before. Um, it's a very giant uh, red star or red giant. And um, if, if that star was at the center of our solar system, the edge of the star extends all the way past the Earth about halfway to Mars. So it's a huge, huge star. And there's also lots of evidence that suggests it's in the process of going supernova. Um, because it's like 400 light years away, it may have already gone supernova, but that light hasn't reached us yet. So, uh, but pretty interesting. Okay, that's Betelgeuse. It's the uh, upper shoulder of Orion. Then we have the lower left foot of Orion. It's a bluish white star. It's also a bright star. And th that star's name is Rigel, R-I-G-E-L. Okay, so I'm describing this by anatomy because here's the, the belt of Orion. And then if Orion is facing you in the night sky, like make an eye contact with you, okay, then the upper right shoulder that's Betelgeuse. And then the lower left knee or foot, depending on how you draw the feller, um, could be uh, Rigel. Okay, so now we're on the line of the winter circle. Let's keep going around clockwise. The dog star, Sirius. I'm serious. Its name is Sirius. <laughs> All right, the dog star, um, it's a, also a whitish blue star, but I would call this a very bright star. In fact, you could even say very, very bright star. Uh, this is the brightest object in the night sky that's, act, that's a star besides the sun, okay? Uh, Venus and Jupiter, which are planets, are a slight magnitude brighter, but Sirius is the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere night sky. All right, keep going around clockwise. We have the small dog star, uh, that's Procyon. It's also a whitish blue star. Um, it's, uh, it's a bright star, but what's different about this is it's clear as a bell. It's just, it's out there kind of by itself and it's a very clear and crisp star. Okay, you'll see what I mean when you look at it. It's pretty amazing. Okay, then going clockwise, we have the twin stars. Uh, two uh, stars of equal brightness that are whitish blue. Um, that's the twins Pollux and Castor, Pollux being the lower one closer to the horizon, Castor being closer to the zenith. And then we have um, Capella. That's that star that's pretty close to the zenith or straight up overhead. Um, I call it a zenith star because as the stars throughout the year, they kind of, they move like this, right? As they arc across the night sky. So we'll often end up with different stars up at the zenith, okay? Like Vega can be a zenith star. Deneb can be a zenith star sometimes. So Capella, when you're looking for the winter circle, uh, between, you know, a couple hours after uh, dinner or at, at dark uh, to about midnight, two o'clock, you'll see Capella up near the zenith, okay? All right, and then last but not least, another... Uh, red star. This one I would call an orange red. Um, it's a little bit more orangish than it is red. Uh, it's also a bright star. Uh, that's the star Aldebaran. And um, that's the eye of the bull constellation or Taurus. Okay, the eye of the bull. Now, if we put all of those together, go ahead and go around in a circle and practice those, right? Calling now, not just pointing at the star, 
but calling out the name of each one of those, right? Okay, I'm gonna start with Capella, Aldebaran, Rigel, Sirius, Procyon, Pollux, Castor, Capella, Aldebaran, Rigel, Sirius. Okay, I realize I didn't label Betelgeuse, but it's the one that's closer to the middle of the circle, not right on the middle. Okay, and so that is how you set your awareness. You looked to the south, you found Orion's belt, you know the measurements of your hands, and you went ahead and measured the, the uh, distance to Betelgeuse and to Rigel. And then we went in a clockwise direction to all the brightest stars, acknowledged how bright they are, acknowledged their color, and then also looked up their name. So now every time that you go outside to see this dark southern night sky, whether this is winter or whether this is like 6 a.m. in September, which you can also see the mornings or the winter circle, uh, name them every single time. Just name them. Uh, we will add to this um, a little bit later and we'll add some of the constellations to these or just feel free to do that on your own uh, using Stellarium or a star wheel you'll find that each of these bright stars are part of a much larger constellation. Capella is part of the circle Orijah, the charioteer. Castor and Pollux are part of the twins, the Gemini twins. Procyon is a small dog. Sirius is a big dog. And these are the hunting dogs of the um, Orion constellation or the hunter. And then as mentioned, Aldebaran is the eye of the bull. Um, that has two really large horns that propagate out in this direction, okay? Um, so practice, um, go on a country drive to go out, uh, out of the valley or just go out to where it's dark to go practice this. Uh, check out a sky quality meter if you can, uh, recording that data. Um, use your space phone and the Globe at Night app to collect that citizen science data. Um, and please just keep being an advocate for a dark night sky. Anytime you get the chance, you know, maybe it's at the water cooler um, outside of the cubicle and just, you know, tell your buddy about, hey, I, you know, saw the stars last night. I had no idea that I could learn any constellations and now I'm learning constellations. Okay. Um, so I think that's a wrap for tonight. Uh, sorry if the big switch to white screen uh, was a little bit too bright, but uh, tonight, we went over some gear and awareness and process of stargazing, talked a little bit about the importance of natural night skies, and then um, hopefully you learned the winter circle, um, all the brightest stars of the winter night sky. Uh, we're going to do this again in March, a stargazing lesson again. That'll be with the five circumpolar constellations that surround the pole star Polaris. Uh, we can probably start to do some questions and answers in the... Um, in the comments section. And I'll leave this last slide up here. Uh, this is what's happening next month at this time, you guys. Uh, February 16th, same time, 530. Uh, we're excited to have Scott, Scott Torland from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife here out of Ontario, um, who works with Lower Waihe Bighorn Sheep uh, doing um, sheep counting surveys. So when I contacted him to ask if he could do this one right now, he was like, oh, sorry, dude, I'll be in a helicopter counting sheep at that time. So he'll join us in a month from now to talk a little bit about um, his work, what it, what he does doing his work, and maybe some of the implications or some of the science um, that, uh, you know, learning about bighorn sheep and ecology and movements during a time of climate change uh, has or that raw data that he collects.